we're going to talk about the, ident- the doctrine of identification, the very power of what it means that you have been identified with Christ. In our world today, the identity of people is being attacked as never before. But that makes sense because Satan is all about not wanting you to know who you are, right? So we're talking in the body of Christ. We're going to go into some scriptures and we're going to really look at some things. And this will be amazing because you you must know who you are. This will be a a great compliment. You know, all these messages, I would have to want to mess this up. I've messed stuff up in my life. Sometimes by accident, most of the time on purpose, but it would be really hard to mess up what I preach here because the Lord is so adamant about things. So we're going to start this series tonight on your identity. And as we go through this, man, I'm telling you, when you get a revelation of who you are, of who you've been made in Christ, you're not going to allow junk in your life anymore. I mean, it, it just changes everything. So let's jump into this. You guys ready? Hallelujah. Let's go to Galatians chapter 2 in verse 20. You know, I believe that Galatians 2.20, if you want to sum this up, this was Paul's confession of faith he said this i am crucified with christ in the greek it would be literally i have been and am crucified with christ nevertheless i live then he goes on to say but wait a minute yet not i but christ lives in me And the life that I now live in the flesh, I live it by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and who gave himself for me. I like the message paraphrase really kind of enhances the Greek. So I'm going to use it in this situation. In the message Bible, the message paraphrase Bible, it it says this, Christ's life showed me how, and enabled me to do it. I identified myself completely with him. So this is why, this is where we're going. Christ's life showed me how. So we're going to learn how in this series. Showed me how, but also the word of God not only shows you things, but it enables you. And enabled me to do it. I identified myself completely with him. And that's what you must do as a child of God to know who you are. My, it says this, Indeed, I have been crucified with Christ. My ego is no longer central. It is no longer important that I appear righteous before you or have your good opinion isn't that interesting in other words paul became deadened to the praise of men and the persecution of men his identity was completely identified with jesus wow it says i am no longer driven to impress god Isn't that amazing? I'm no longer driven to impress him. Christ lives in me. The life you see me living in is not mine. Wow. The life that you see me living is not mine. That's part of your identity. My life is no longer my own. That's the way we were created. We get all messed up when we start getting self-centered. That's the very nature of the enemy, right? But it is lived by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. In other words, 
my complete and my total identity comes from Jesus Christ. Wow. In other words, another way to say that is who I am comes from Christ. If you want to know who you are, don't look at your behavior. Don't look at how much money you make. Don't look at your past mistakes. Don't look at what everybody else says about you. Your identity comes from him. What does he say about me? Remember now, we're talking about what God says about you. So this is not subject to change. This is not just a fact. It's way beyond fact. It's truth. It's who you really are. The enemy is stealing, killing, and destroying children of God in their lives, wreaking havoc because they don't know who they are. They're trying to impress God to maybe get him to answer a prayer or two. They're trying to impress people, and, and which keeps them from really doing what God's called them to do in the capacity. All of these things. They get messed up in the thinking that their life is defined by a mistake that they made or a wrong choice that they made. Sometimes things and events happen in people's lives and they feel like their life is over. That, and, and see, what Satan's always trying to do is steal your future, right? But that's all lies. So let's go to Matthew chapter 16. Matthew chapter 16, verse 13. This is about an event where Jesus took his disciples to a place that no rabbi would take his disciples to. He took his disciples to the temple of Pan, and it's a temple that was literally to the god Pan. It was in the side of a cliff, carved in stone, and there's a huge cave. We've been there. And that cave was called the gates of hell. Right? And that's where Jesus said, listen, the gates of hell will never prevail against the church. But let's read about this event because there's a principle that's a foundational principle that we'll go into that, that we'll see in this event. Matthew chapter 16, verse 13, when Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples saying, whom do men say that I the son of man am? And they said, well, some say you're John the Baptist, some Elias, others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. But then Jesus said to them, but whom do you say that I am? Then Simon Peter answered and said, you are the Christ. That's the anointed one. In other words, Jesus, you are the Messiah. Right? The son of the living God. Wow. In other words, this is the first time that it was revealed, the revelation that God anoints men, that which is going to be a foundation in him building the church. Do you know that when Jesus went to heaven, the Holy Spirit was poured out? Do you know there's an anointing that resides within you? There's an anointing that's upon you? God anointing men, right? Well, here's Jesus. He's all God. He's all man. He's the God man. And all of a sudden, something happened to Peter and he knew. Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee. Now we know where this revelation came from, but my Father which is in heaven. So in other words, revelation knowledge came to Peter from the Father, no doubt how, by the Holy Spirit, that Jesus, this man that they had been following, that they saw all these miracles, that they saw all this stuff happening, is the coming Messiah. He's here. Wow. Isn't it interesting? The disciples saw all these miracles, and yet they didn't see 
that the Messiah was with them until the Father revealed it to Simon. They saw all these miracles. In the same way, the children of Israel in the wilderness saw all these miracles, and yet they still didn't believe God. Isn't that amazing? So in other words, this is why we talk a lot about revelation knowledge. Listen, I'm not going to teach you. Now, you might think you understand some things about your identity, but when you get a revelation from God on who Jesus is, that's, within that revelation, is a revelation of your identity. And so many believers have never had this I'm telling you guys, this is thrilling. This is what empowers you to walk by faith. This is what empowers you to yield to the love of God. This is what empowers you to fear nothing anymore. This is what empowers you to know that all things are possible to him who believes. Right? Everything changes when you get a revelation of who Jesus is, and it only comes one way. Oh, you could read your Bible hours and hours every day, but unless the Holy Spirit reveal who God is through these pages, you won't see anything. Now, the good news is he's here to reveal, and if you decide to read your Bible hours and hours every day and you're open to it, man, he'll just pour revelation knowledge of who he is. So let's go on with this. Verse 18, and I also, or and I say also unto thee, so he's talking to Peter. Actually, he's talking to Simon Peter, right? Simon Barjona. And I say also unto thee that thou art Peter. Okay, this is a big, big thing, big foundational piece. You are Peter. It's the Greek word petros. It means a piece of a rock. Okay? The word never means it's the rock. It always means it's a piece of the rock. Okay? So I, I also say to you that you are Peter, and upon this rock, upon what rock? Now see, people, people will think, whole, whole religions or denominations will think, well, the rock is Peter. But Peter's not the rock, he's a piece of the rock. The rock is even more than Jesus. The rock is revelation knowledge of who Jesus is. That is the foundation that the church is built upon. And flesh and blood does not reveal that. No, no, the Spirit of God reveals that to us. This is, this is big, okay? Upon this rock, I will build my church. What's really cool, this is the first time the word church is mentioned. Upon revelation knowledge of who Jesus, the anointed one and his anointing, that's who I'm going to build my church on. That's what I'm going to build my church on. That revelation knowledge of that. And it says, and the gates of hell shall not prevail. This Greek word means they, the gates of hell will not overpower. The gates of hell will never be superior in strength. Oh, I'm telling you, Satan can do and move and yell and scream. But my Bible says, while we are here, the gates of hell will not overpower us, will not ever, ever, ever be superior in strength. This, this Greek word also means we'll never get the upper hand. Are you part of the church tonight? Then he is done. Satan can never overpower you. He can never get the upper hand. He is not superior in strength you have the greater one on the inside of you he is the lesser one and i mean much 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 lesser we're gonna see so much less than it's not even to be compared so thou art peter 
you see this over and over again in Scripture. All of a sudden, an encounter happens, and then the name is changed. Here's the principle that you got to see. Once you gain revelation knowledge of who Jesus is, he will reveal to you who you are. Society starting to tell us, listen, you decide what gender you are. Bills are trying to be passed that you can't say he or she. Right now, we have people that work in medical facilities that they have to use whatever pronoun the person says they are. Right? That's straight from the pit. Why? Because identity is everything. What happened in the wilderness when Jesus was tempted? What was the first thing Satan said to him? If you be the Son of God... He came against his identity. God wants you to know who you are in Christ. Your complete identification is with him. Everything. Who you are is identified and defined in who he is. So that's the principle. Your identity, who you really are, is wrapped up in who he is. This is why God says things like, whoever's born of God overcomes the world. God calls you a world overcomer. Because why? Because he knows who you are. But it's, see, it's not who you are. You can't say, well, who, you know, who I am. No, no, who I am is wrapped up in who Jesus is. Colossians says this, that I've been tucked away with Christ in God. I'm one spirit with him. Isn't that amazing? Hallelujah. Jesus Christ and the revelation of that rock is the rock that the church is built upon. Hallelujah. I love this. Your name is Peter. It's Petros. It's a piece of the rock. Do you know you're a piece of the rock? Amen. Right? We're not talking about prudential insurance. <laughs> nope. Nope, we're all a piece of the rock. Isn't that awesome? I love that. We discover who we are when we see who he is. You have to see who he is to even know who you are. Right. Say la. I mean, you know, what else can you say? What is eternal life? It's knowing, gaining revelation knowledge of who God the Father is and who his son Jesus is. It's, it's literally eternal life because now you know who you are. Isn't that amazing? When you see who he is, that's when you know who you are. If you don't see who he is, you won't know who you are. You'll think you're a mistake. You'll think you're worthless. You'll think you're a person with no future. You'll think you're just a mess going, waiting to happen. And none of that is true. It is not true. All of that is a lie. All of it's a lie. You can never discover your true identity until you completely surrender your life to Jesus Christ. So don't get mad at pol political leaders that you don't agree with. If they're not born again, they don't even know who they are. Everybody in your life who's not saved, they don't know who they are because they don't know who Jesus is. Sadly, many Christians that we bump elbows with, with don't know who they are. And they're out doing crazy stuff and all this stuff, and they have inner turmoil, and they don't know what to do about it. Some people say, I don't want to go to church. And we think it's because they just don't want to go to church. 
But what you don't know is if you strip it all down, it's because church has never worked for them. And they, they, they stay away. That faith stuff doesn't work. I tried it. I tithed one Sunday. You know, or whatever, right? It's because they don't know who they are, because they've never surrendered their life to Christ. When you surrender your life to Christ, you begin to see who he is, and then you discover who you are. So Romans chapter 8 in verse 16, this will bring a whole new meaning to this verse that you know. What does the Holy Spirit do? The Spirit himself bears witness with your spirit that you are what? Children of God. Not servants, children. You're not, you're not standing at the right hand of God with Jesus. You're seated with him because you're royalty. You're God's child. You're God's offspring. If you don't get your identity from Christ, then where will you get your identity from? Right? We have people getting their identity from a lot of places, and it all, all roads lead to death. Man, I'm telling you, you could, can you sense this? Even for the people watching online right now, this is like, this is a very incredible, uh, strong moment in your life. This, this statement puts you at a crossroads, right? Am I going to completely surrender? Or am I going to keep playing church? I'm telling you, go all in with God. Because it's, it's literally thrilling. So let's look at Matthew 16. Let's go back there. So Matthew chapter 16, this is powerful, verse 18. And I say also unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Verse, nine, verse 19, and I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven. The keys. What do keys do? They unlock things, don't they? If they're unlocked, what do they do? They'll lock things, right? Guess what? Here's the way it works now. And I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Now, what happens is when you decide to use the keys, all of heaven stands behind you. The God of the universe, when you decide to use a key, he backs you up. What does that look like? Look at what it says. And whatsoever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatsoever you shall loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. In other words, God will allow what you allow. And God will not allow what you don't allow. You have been given the keys if you don't allow sickness in your body, guess what? Heaven will back that up. And the healing power of God will be released and drive it out of your body. If you won't allow poverty and lack in your life, God won't allow it. Wow. I wonder if that means if God, if, if maybe if we decide we don't want to allow, we don't want to allow people, children, in our city to go, to go to bed hungry every night. I wonder if maybe God would start moving in there. Amen. See, this is a foundation of prayer. Man, you can't pray effectively if you don't know who you are. This is a big scripture. So let's jump over to Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3. I've been living in Colossians with the men for like 13 weeks. And they're all laughing because we go kind of slow. But uh, Colossians chapter 3 will give you a picture of what we're talking about because it really talks about your identity. Verse 1 says this, If you then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ sits on the right hand of God. 
Colossians 3.1, now 3.2, set your affection on things above and not on the earth. For you are dead and your life is hid with Christ in God. Amen. This is who you are. So let's read this literally. If, it would be the Greek word that means since. Since you then were risen with Christ, pursue with all your heart the things that are above. So if you're pursuing with all your heart the things which are above, do you have any room to pursue with your heart things that are not above? No. no. Where Christ sits. In other words, I am to pursue the things that deal with where Christ is sitting. On the right hand of God. In other words, I am to pursue with all my heart. What is, what is that position at the right hand of God? That is the position of ultimate authority in the universe. In other words, I'm to pursue with all my heart the position of authority that I have in Christ. Not on things of the earth. Why would I do that? Because you're dead. And your life, it literally, this is the way it would read in a literal Greek, for you died and your life, this is not the word for natural life, this is the word zoe, and your zoe life, well, who gave you zoe life? Jesus did. I've come to give you life, zoe, and that more abundantly. Where is that life? Your life, your zoe life, look at this, is, or in literally it would read, has been hid together with Christ in God. You want to walk in zoe life? You can't do it if you look at things on the earth. You've got to literally pursue with all your heart things that are above. This is, this is a huge thing. So let's keep going. Let's jump down to verse 10, and this is what I want you to see. And have put on the new man. Now this word put on means you've dressed yourself in the new man. What is the new man? The new spirit being that I am in Christ, which is being renewed in knowledge. Now this word knowledge literally means that my spirit man is being renewed by revelation knowledge. Remember what I said? Unless you see who he is, you can't know who you are. You'll never discover who you are. So my spirit... I put on, I dress myself in this new man because this new man is being. This is present tense. It's continually being renewed in knowledge, in revelation knowledge, which comes from the Holy Spirit after, this Greek word means according to, the exact image, the exact sculpting and carving of him, that, of him, Jesus, that created him, you and I. So when we look at this, I put on the new man. How can you put that on if you don't know who he is? And this new man is what? Renewed. Being renewed. Your new man is renewed. If you gain revelation knowledge of who you are in Christ... Now you put on this new man, and this new man is renewed, is constantly being renewed by revelation knowledge that's coming from the Holy Spirit. Revelation knowledge of what? The Word. Right? According to the exact image as in sculpting or carving of him, Jesus, that created him. You and I. In other words, when I was born again, I was a brand new spirit. I was a new species. I was complete in him. 
So when you get born again, you're complete, but you're not completely developed. So you need to be continually renewed. In other words, this, this Greek word, after the image of him, after the sculpture. So the Holy Spirit, as you meditate in the word of God, as you believe the word in your heart and speak it out of your mouth, the Holy Spirit is down on the inside of you, sculpturing and carving and molding you. Basically, this is what Paul said. This is, this is what, it burns in my heart all the time for all of you as a pastor that Christ would be formed in you. This is what this is talking about. Most believers never have Christ formed in them so they never know who they are. So what happens, Christ is formed in you as a result of your spirit completely being renewed in the knowledge, the revelation knowledge of who Jesus is. This is why in, in I think, 1st or 2nd Corinthians, it says, when we peer into him, we are changed into his image. As, we, as you peer into the word of God, you gain revelation knowledge of who you are, and the Holy Spirit is on the inside of you forming and carving and molding you into the image of Jesus, and that image starts showing up on the outside. We're renewed. Our life is transformed by the renewing of our mind. That word transformed is the Greek word metamorpho. Jesus was transfigured on the mountain in Israel, on Mount Tabor, he was transfigured. What, who he was on the inside, shown on the outside, his, his, literally his countenance shone like the sun, brighter than the sun. As you meditate in the word of God, as you stay open to the Holy Spirit and stop saying no to God, what happens, see, many, many Christians are not, they're not molded their spirit man's not molded into someone who knows God as their provider. Their spirit is not molded into someone who knows God as their healer. Their spirit is not molded as someone who knows God as their protector. And this is why we are the body of Christ. As you allow the Holy Spirit to mold you on the inside, what is your part? Your part is to put the word of God first. Give it your undivided attention. Keep it before your eyes. Never let it depart out of your mouth. Keep it in the midst of your heart. As you do that, the word will become a lamp to your feet and a light to your path. It will show you where you are. It'll show you where to go. And how you go, the light of the word will shine there. What, what is that? The light is coming out of your spirit about a revelation of some, you just learned something new about Jesus and you were molded into that image and then you progressed. And then another revelation of who Jesus is and then you progress. So many Christians in their life are going nowhere because they don't know this. And you can't do this on your own. This is all him. You just gotta be willing and obedient, that's it. Well, if I just go to the right Bible school, if I just do this, if I just... No, you can't figure this out. You don't have to. You don't, you don't decide. So many Christians are deciding where they go to church or where they live or who they marry. They're deciding their careers. They go to college and they're like, well, I think I'll do that. No, no, we are Christians. We don't, discover, we don't decide anything. We discover everything because our future is not in front of us. It's within us. This is huge. Galatians 4.19, you don't have to turn there, but this is Paul speaking. He says, my little children, of whom I travail in birth again. Paul travailed in intercession before they got saved, he would travail in intercession. He'd go to a place, travail in intercession, start leading people to Christ, and then, then he would travail in supplication. 
That's a prayer that helps a child of God lay hold of the plan of God for their life. He would travail again in supplication. Why? Until Christ be formed in them. This is why we will always preach the word. The only difference, the only difference is in May of 2021, we'll be at one level. June of 2021, we'll be at a higher level. Why? Because we are growing. That's, and is it because of us? Nope. It's because of him. Isn't this good news? So, naturally, there are three ways that people get their identity. Okay? There's genetic determinism. Let's look at that one first. Genetic determinism. In other words, it's in your DNA. Have you ever gone to a doctor and they want you to fill out a form? And they ask you questions. Has anybody in your lineage had cancer? Because if your great-grandmother, your grandmother, and your mom had cancer, they're going to probably look at you and go, well, you know, your genetic determinism, you're gonna, your future is a cancer patient. Right? Well, this person in your, in your family lineage was an alcoholic or a drug addict, and then this person was, and this, so you know you're going to be prone this way. Genetic determinism. In other words, I was born this way. Who I am is because of the way I was born. My identity is in my genetic determinism. It's from my parents, it's from my lineage. And see, there's truth in that. There's truth in all three of these. But I got to tell you, in Christ, determinism changes all the other determinisms. But if you don't know in Christ's determinism, you will struggle your whole life with the other three determinisms. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 23 says this, 1 Peter 1, 23, being born again, not of corruptible seed. You, were, you and I were born again, but not with corruptible seed. But of incorruptible by the word of God, which lives and abides forever. This is why you must be born again. Right? My lineage is you are of God, little children. Who is my father? He is the God of the universe. That's my lineage, and that changes everything. Have, have, you, have you ever noticed, see, people will get to this thing where they're middle-aged, and they have this identity crisis because they're trying to find themselves. But that's really kind of silly because every teenager has an identity crisis. It usually starts pretty young and they're trying to find themselves. But you can only find yourself when you completely come to Christ because your identity is in him. So you could look, you could look at everything the world has to offer and did you notice the more you look at these things, the more you try to find yourself, the more lost you get. Because with Satan, all roads lead to death. Man, this is why. This is why Jake, Alicia, Teresa, right, Elise, they are passionate about young people. Ryan and Carissa, college age, right? Leanne, the women of the church. I mean, this is why we're passionate about this because you cannot, this is what some people do, but I'm here to tell you tonight, you cannot find yourself in a movie. Now, I know that sounds silly, but do you know how many people watch movies and it moves them because they're trying to find their identity in a movie? You can't find your identity on YouTube. You can't, here's a big one, you can't find your identity in the video game world. 
I had one young man tell me one time, he said, Pastor, I am just awkward everywhere, except I am really good at this one video game. And he gets online and he plays with people all over the world. And he goes, there I am respected and it's my, it's my world. But you don't, find your, you don't find your identity in video games. Here's another big one. You don't find your identity. You cannot find your identity in your job or your career. You can't. You can't find your identity in money and things. This is why, man, you have this person who's, who's very successful and, they, and, and everybody looks at them as this wonderful person and they all want to be around them because of the money that they have. And then they start losing it or things happen and they lose some things and their whole identity, they, they found their identity in this. And many times it ends in suicide, right? Panic attacks, all these things. You can't find your identity in ministry. My identity is not found in pastoring this church. My identity is found in the constant revelation knowledge of who Jesus is. That's the only place. So see, be careful not to get your identity wrapped up in things or events. Your identity's found one place. See, this is why this whole genetic determinism, this is why people blame their parents, right? Remember Paul, Galatians 2.20, right? Paul is literally saying, I am who I am because of what Jesus has done for me. I love 1 Corinthians 15.10. 1 Corinthians 15.10, but by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace, which was bestowed upon me, was not in vain. But I labored more abundantly than they all. But then he goes, yet not I. In other words, Paul's saying, wait a minute, no, no, I wasn't the one laboring. But the grace of God, which was with me. The grace of God made him who he was. The grace of God was the Holy Spirit of God on the inside of Paul, molding him and sculpting him and shaping him, forming Christ in him. How do I know how to pastor? Because I know how it is as Christ is formed in me, so I know how to help other people, teach people and help them and lead them so Christ can be formed in them. If a, pastor doesn't, if a pastor doesn't have Christ formed in him, you might be a great preacher, you might, you might be super dynamic, you might be brilliant, but nothing really is going to be happening. And in the Christian world today, man, I'm telling you, you might, have, you might have a church of thousands of people, but what do you have? You don't know. Probably not much. Because you got to know you got to know how to lead people. You can't, you can't lead somebody someplace where you have not been. Right? This is why our identity is so, so very important. The next one is environmental determinism. So we have this genetic determinism, but now we have environmental determinism. In other words, I am who I am because of the environment that I was raised in. Right? I was raised in this environment, and this is why I am who I am. It identifies, it has given me my identity. That's not, now there's truth to it, but in Christ's determinism, it, it, it literally erases all of that and now sets you on a different course. You could be raised in the worst of the worst situations and be completely whole. I am not even close to the man that I was. I mean, I mean, not even in the same universe. Just not. 
And I'm telling you, I'm so grateful. Because all I had to do is just say yes to Jesus. Yes, of course, I'll completely submit to you. I give myself to you. Right? I love this. Environmental determinism. See, some people are like, I'm an American. I'm a Nebraskan. I don't know why you'd boast about this. I'm a corn husker. I mean, I, I can't wait till we could actually boast about that a little bit, right? Man, I'm from Omaha, right? Meet people from California. I grew up in California, Southern California, right? I grew up as a kid in Chicago. Well, I'm from Chicago. You know, when you live there, you'd probably go, gosh, I'm really sorry about that. <laughs> but, you know, some people think that's really cool. You know, oh, I'm, I'm from Southern California. Yeah. That's kind of an error if you've lived there. What's really bad, oh, I'm from L.A. That would make me in Southern California throw up. I mean, it's like, dude, get over yourself. But no, no, this is not, see, this can shape a person's identity, right? I grew up in this neighborhood, and I went to school, and, you know, I mean, I, I, I grew up, I, I pulled my 73 Brown Maverick into the parking lot of Corona Del Mar High School in Newport Beach and parked next to a Ferrari, <laughs> and there's Porsches everywhere. And that Christmas... I got a pair of jeans for, for Christmas. When guys on the same basketball team, we're going to France, we're going here. I knew guys that got condos on the beach for graduation presents. I got a typewriter. <laughs> That's just, so, so I'm not, you know, you drive around Southern California. It was so bad, I had this one, I had a Honda Civic that had an oil leak, that when I'd start it, there'd be this massive white cloud. My friend Bill, my good friend Bill, he does all this video stuff, he made, he, he made a video of it, I didn't even know. It was bad, it was bad. But you know, that wasn't my identity, I was finding out my identity. And I had to be careful when I washed that 73 Brown Maverick because if that power washer hit the wrong place, another piece would fall off my car because of all the rust. And that, that, that Honda Civic was the same thing too, man. There's rust everywhere. You'd hit it and all of a sudden, oh shoot, there's a hole in my door now, right? But you know, if you sat in that thing, it was clean. And I took care of it all the, the best I could. And I'm not driving a 1973 Brown Maverick anymore. Right? But I'm telling you, I could drive one tomorrow. And I wouldn't be driving down the street thinking, oh gosh, this is embarrassing. You know why? Because my identity's not in that. Amen. My identity's in Christ. Amen. That's good. I'm free from all of that. Yeah. All of that. I used to wear Armani suits and wear a Rolex watch and, and, and all these. I'd spend so much money on clothes because I was a worthless piece of dirt in the business world. And I was trying, my clothes defined me. Not anymore. Yeah, like to dress nice. You know, I like to dress nice. But guess what? If I couldn't, an old pair of shoes... Jeans with holes in them, they'd be pressed, they'd be nice, they'd be clean. And I wouldn't feel, I wouldn't feel weird. I used to feel, I would, I used to, but not anymore. Because my identity is not in this. Guys, why am I saying this? We're going really into this. Your environment does not define you. Your genetics do not define you. Amen. When you discover who he is, when you get a revelation of who he is, you find out and discover who you are. First John 4.4 4 says this, you are of God, little children, and have overcome them because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. 
1 John 5, 4. For whatsoever, I love this, it's the Greek word whosoever, is born of God, overcomes the world. And this is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. See, you and I are in this world, but we are not of this world. Yes, yes, you are human, but you are not only human. God, you got to see that. I am a citizen of the United States. That is my secondary citizenship. I'm first a citizen of heaven. And I am here to bring heaven to this earth. I don't pray from earth to heaven. I pray from heaven to earth. Our environment never defines us. The third one is a big one. The psychological determination or determinism. Psychological. In other words, you are what you think. Well, there's a truth to that, right? The Bible says a lot about that. This, this is saying your thinking is a result of your experiences. Your thinking is a result of what has happened to you. So you got to be careful. It says in Romans chapter 8, verse 5, in the New Revised Standard Version, I love that in this verse because it brings out the Greek very well, the NRSV. It says, for those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those that live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. Where a person sets their minds will determine whether he walks <clears throat> after the flesh or after the spirit. So you've got to be careful what you're hearing, who you're hearing, and how you're hearing. This is so big in your identity. Proverbs 23, 7, in the Young's literal translation of this verse, it says, for as he hath thought in his soul, so is he. Literally, it would read, for as he thinks within himself, so is he. But here is the thing. The overall direction of a man's life cannot be isolated from his thoughts. Your thoughts have a big part. If Satan can keep you thinking wrong, then he can shape your identity and affect and shape your personality. This is why we are formed as we gain revelation knowledge of who Jesus is. As we, dis the, as we gain revelation of who he is, we discover who we are. And all three of these determinisms, all of them, your genetic, your environmental, right? All of these determinisms, your psychological determinism, all of them, there's truth in them, but they are all eradicated with the in Christ determinism. Your true identity, who you really are, is found in Christ. We're going to talk a lot about this. See, if you, if you do not find your identity in Christ, your whole life will be trying to figure out who you are based on your where, the way your genetics, the way your environment, and, and what's happened to you in life, your thoughts and all this stuff. You'll be trying to figure it out. And here's the thing, you can't. Everybody who does not know God, they have no hope of ever finding out who they are. But there's so many Christians who don't rightly divide the word. Why does a Christian just want to live their own life, do their own thing. They don't want to read their Bible. They don't want to go to church. They don't want to serve God. Most Christians have never led anybody to Christ, are not discipling anybody. They're just living their own life. The reason why is because they don't know who they are because they've never got a revelation that has been formed over time in them so that Christ is formed in them and starts showing up on the outside. 
I remember when God told me, he spoke to me one time and he said, Tony, I cannot wait till you meet yourself. And man, I'm telling you, I'm so glad that I said yes to him because I'm getting to know Christ, which is causing me to be literally molded and shaped and having Christ formed in me. And that's what shows up on the outside in loving the unlovable, in being fearless. See, the Bible says some incredible things. God will speak things to you about you that you can't even, you've never, ever seen it before. Right? He told Gideon, man, you are a mighty man of valor. What? He didn't say you will be. He didn't say, Gideon, here's the deal. If you'll change your hair, you know, and, and kind of change your wardrobe a little bit, and then if you'll save up money and go to this particular school, and then you get around these people, over time, you will become a mighty man of valor. Nope, he said, no, Gideon, right where you are right now, I call you a mighty man of valor. Abraham, you are a father of many nations right now. The Bible says things like this to you. You can do all things through Christ who strengthens you, right? To Callie, you know what, Callie? All things are possible if you'll just simply believe, right? See, this is where we're going because God's plan for your life, it's, it's, it's divine and it's fulfilling.